police have released their 2023 hate crimes report, and there was a significant jump in the number of hate crimes reported last year. Donald Trump speaks to reporters a day after a jury found him guilty of all 34 felony counts that he was facing. We're going to have more on what happens next coming up. And the Jays will debut their new uniforms tonight when they host the Pittsburgh Pirates. The City Connect jerseys are now available for fans to buy in the team shop. This is a live look. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us. Toronto police say there was a significant jump in the number of hate crimes reported last year. The service says there were 365 hate crimes reported to police in 2023 compared to 248 in 2022. That's an increase of 47 percent. The report says the Jewish to SLGBTQ, black and Muslim communities were the most frequently victimized groups. Mischief to property, assault, and uttering threats were the most common offenses. And police say that the Israel-Hamas war is one of the reasons for the rise in hate-motivated incidents. The ongoing conflict in the Middle East has affected Toronto's residents unlike any other. In the weeks that followed the October 7th attack, Toronto experienced a significant increase in hate crime reporting. In the month of October, hate crime calls for service increased from 68 to 208, a 206% increase from the previous month. And police say 59 people were charged in relation to 61 incidents last year. Well, Toronto Police Chief Myron Demkew gave an update this morning on response times to priority one calls, which rose to more than 22 minutes late last year. Across the service, we continue to see a rise in calls for service, which are up 7.9% so far this year. Despite this significant increase in call volume, we are seeing the direct results of improved supervisory capacity and the strategic deployment of additional police officers so far this year. The chief says hiring more officers and strategic deployment are key to getting response times down. Well, police have outlined the circumstances in which they would take action to clear the pro-Palestinian encampment at the University of Toronto. Given the manner in which events have unfolded to date, including the fact that the demonstrators were permitted by the University of Toronto to remain on their property and the decision of the Quebec court denying McGill University and interim injunction, the Trespass to Property Act does not give the Toronto Police Service sufficient legal authority to clear an encampment. Therefore, absent a material change of circumstances, the Toronto Police Service will only act in situations involving an emergency to enforce the law and protect public safety or act in accordance with a court order. Deputy Chief Rob Johnson cited a recent court decision in Quebec, as you just heard, that denied an injunction to clear the encampment and the fact that U of T initially allowed the demonstrators to remain on campus. The University of Toronto has applied for its own injunction, which won't be heard in court until late June. And two men have been charged with multiple firearms offenses and what police say is an investigation also linked to three murders. 34-year-old Corey Denton from Scarborough and 37-year-old Jasveer Gill from Quebec are facing weapons possession and firearm discharge charges in relation to three residential shootings that occurred in Brampton. And Bill police say that those shootings are connected to a homicide in Mississauga and a double homicide in Caledon, all taking place in November of last year. And Bill, police were called out last night to two separate fatal crashes involving motorcycles. A man in his 20s was killed in a collision involving a motorcycle and an SUV in Mississauga. This happened just before 10 o'clock. This is near Derry Road and Mavis Road. The police say that the man who was driving the motorcycle was rushed to a trauma center, but later died of his injuries. The woman in the SUV was taken to hospital with minor injuries. Police say that it's early in the investigation. But they're looking at speed and dangerous driving as possible factors in the collision. The investigators from our major collisions bureau will be on scene for the next couple of hours, working very closely with our road closure unit and forensic identification services to process the scene and gather all evidence that's necessary in order to determine what the major causes were behind this incident. Well, Pill police say that as the warmer weather hits, drivers need to be aware 
that more motorcyclists are going to be using the road, as well as cyclists and pedestrians. And a man in his 20s is dead after a collision in Brampton involving a motorcycle. And Peel police say that the motorcycle collided with a transit bus at here Ontario Street and Petworth Road, north of Sandalwood, around 6 o'clock yesterday evening. A motorcyclist in his 20s was pronounced dead at the scene. No one on the bus was hurt. An investigation is now underway to determine if charges will be laid. And police say that the crash is a reminder that everyone needs to be alert to other vehicles on the road. Peel police are appealing for witnesses to the crash or anybody who was in the area, as we noted, and has a dash cam video. Well, three men are facing a combined 292 charges following a traffic stop by the OPP in Brampton. And yeah, police say that the stopped vehicle was on Peel Center Drive in the city of Brampton Wednesday night. When they searched the vehicle, they found dozens of credit cards, identities, and quantity of drugs and money. Well, eventually, Deep Singh, Jaskaran Singh, and Sakjinder Singh, they're all facing trafficking charges, as well as charges related to processing credit cards and IDs. Well, there is just a week left before thousands of frontline TTC staff could walk off the job and workers. They are gearing up for this strike. Yeah, practice picket line was set up outside the Wilson TTC complex this morning. The workers union says that it's part of the plan to be ready for a strike. More than 11,000 operators, collectors, station staff, and other employees could hit the picket lines for real June 7. Wages, benefits, and job security, those are among the key issues at the bargaining table. We could see total disruption of transit service across the city of Toronto on June the 7th. Uh, and over the last three days, what we've been doing is mobilizing our members, mobilizing them, and uh, we're doing practice pickets. Uh, we haven't had the right to strike in over a decade. Uh, and so what we're doing is sharpening our tools and making sure that uh, our members are prepared and ready to go on a strike line. Mayor Olivia Chow says that she's hopeful a deal can be reached to avoid a stoppage. I don't think we need a bridge, bridge at this point because I am still remaining to be optimistic and as the negotiation is continuing, uh, there's a whole weekend in front of us. So um, it, when you continue to talk, it's always good to uh, seek, uh, seek some kind of uh, solution. The TTC issued a statement, and that reads in part, the TTC values the important work that all our employees do every day to deliver safe and reliable service. The employees in ATU Local 113 are an integral part of our operations. That goes on to say, currently, bargaining teams from ATU Local 113 and the TTC remain at the table where we continue to negotiate a new collective agreement to replace the one that expired on March 31st, 2024. We remain optimistic that we can reach a deal at the bargaining table. And former U.S. President Donald Trump has addressed the media the day after he was found guilty of all 34 criminal charges that he faced at his hush money trial. CTV's Tony Grace is following that story today and joins us live with the latest. Wow, that was a lot from now. Convicted felon Donald Trump. Walk us through some of the takeaways from his remarks. Yeah, Lena and Bakari, if it's even possible to encapsulate everything that Donald Trump said and all of the remarks that were made during that 33-minute address that he made last hour in New York City, the day after those guilty verdicts came in on all 34 counts he was facing. So yes, Trump spoke for about half an hour. Uh, a couple of takeaways. He did vow to appeal. We knew that's something that his legal team was working on, expecting to get together in the coming weeks. He read from two pages of notes that were written in black Sharpie, but obviously went off those notes for, for quite a bit because it took 33 minutes to, to finish the statement. So a couple of takeaways. Uh, once again, uh, repeating his opinion that the whole case was baseless, that it was politically motivated. It was kind of part campaign speech, part uh, g going into more detail about the case itself. So here are some of those thoughts from Donald Trump, first of all, on, on the actual case and his conviction. The okay. public understands and they understand what's what's going on. This is a scam. There's a rigged trial. It shouldn't have been in that venue. We shouldn't have had that judge. He should have allowed, allowed us to have an election expert. We had the best expert, most respected expert, head of the Federal Elections Commission. He was all set to testify. He was waiting for two days. And when it was his turn, Bragg's people protested. And the judge knocked him out, said you can't testify. 
A live look now at New York City, right outside Trump Tower. Something else we heard was Donald Trump call some of the witnesses who testified against him salacious. Some experts noting that he was really testing the limits of the gag order surrounding this case with some of the comments that he was making uh, this morning. And something else, guys, that he said that kind of stood out was that he insisted that he wanted to testify and that he could have if he had chosen to. However, something that he said was that people would have would have taken everything out of context. In his words, they would have said it was a beautiful sunny day when it was raining out. And he also complained that the judge wanted to go into every detail about everything he was ever involved in. So again, insisting that the case was baseless, it was politically motivated, uh, insisting that he is doing something for this country, doing something for the Constitution, and saying that this should never be allowed to happen to another president. Okay, so the path forward, we know that he still intends to run for president. We know there's nothing stopping him from running for president or even taking office under the provisions of the Constitution. But what does that look like going forward and what does it do to his not only his base of support, but perhaps those in swing states and on the periphery, perhaps the uh, independents and uh, the undecided right now? Lots of questions as we look ahead to, well, expected to be a debate with Trump and Joe Biden just four weeks from now. The sentencing expected to happen July 11th. Unclear if that would change in light of an appeal being put together by Trump's team. And then a week after the scheduled sentencing, the Republican National Convention, where Trump is expected to formally be named a presidential candidate after this historic conviction in a New York court. Guys? Fascinating stuff. Tony Grace reporting live from our national newsroom. Thanks, Tony. You bet. And Statistics Canada says that the economy grew in the first quarter of the year. The agency says the annualized rate of growth in the first three months of 2024 came in at 1.7 percent. It was fueled by how higher housing spending. Spending on services was up 1.1 percent, while spending on goods increased by 0.3 percent. Stats Canada says real GDP was essentially unchanged in March following 0.2 percent growth in February. Its preliminary estimate for the economy in April points to growth of 0.3 percent. And coming up next on TP24 Live and Air, it's going to be a tough weekend to get around the city. We'll tell you about the plan Gardner, DVP and TTC closures next. Loblaws looking to put their discount stores in smaller spaces. No frills and maxi stores would have a smaller footprint and could be placed in a wider variety of areas like beneath condo buildings. The company has a handful of smaller discount stores already, but plans to lean into the strategy as a way of reaching more customers. That is the plan forward. Some city market stores are being converted to the no frills brand and Loblaws says it'll cater to the local neighborhood. And heads up for drivers on Sunday, both major highways into the city are going to be closed. Yeah, it could be a very tricky drive. Here's what you need to know. The Gardner is going to be closed from South Kingsway to the DVP, and the DVP will be closed from the Gardner to York Mills from midnight Sunday until 4 p.m. Lots going on. This is all for the Bike for Brain Health event, where over 10,000 cyclists will take to the roads in support of the goal to defeat dementia. All the funds raised, by the way, will go directly to the Bay. Crest Foundation. And there's also going to be a partial closure on the Line 1 subway this weekend. It serves both ways between St. Clair and Shepherd Young stations. It's going to be shut down Saturday and Sunday for planned track work. Shuttle buses will operate. Service is going to resume Monday at 6 a.m. And the TTC's deputy CEO was asked about whether they considered moving the subway closure in light of Sunday's highway closures and the Jays game in the afternoon. Toronto is a hugely popular place. There are events going on every weekend. And we, while we try, we work very closely with transportation at the City of Toronto. We, tr we strive to minimize the inconvenience to select groups. At any point when we have a system closure, there's going to be some minor inconvenience. We do our very best to minimize that. We work collaboratively across all of the city departments to make sure that that's accomplished. So unfortunately, the work has to be done. Uh, some parts of our system are 70 years old and older, and uh, they need work that sometimes can't be accomplished in that tiny window between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Toronto police say it expects significant delays in the downtown core, particularly on the arterial roadways. The lifeguards are going to be back at some Toronto beaches starting tomorrow. City lifeguards are identifiable by their red and yellow uniforms and are stationed either in white rowboats in the water along the shore or at a lifeguard stand. Designated swim areas are marked between two red over yellow flags with a lifeguard stand marked lifeguard on duty nearby. 
Well, those who missed out on the Northern Lights show earlier this month, you might get a second chance to see the Aurora Borealis activity. That could be very cool after a roughly two-week hiatus on the other side of the sun. The sunspot region responsible for this solar event has now shifted directions toward the Earth-facing side of our star. The activity not expected to be as powerful as last time. However, most of Canada could potentially see the solar storms tonight, with many more possible in the next few weeks. Well, the Blue Jays City Connect jerseys, they are now available at the team store. And CB24's Melissa Duggan is checking that out for us. She joins us live this afternoon with the latest. Hey there, Melissa. Hey, so sports meets fashion, not a bad way to spend a Friday. Walk with me, shop with me, would you? Let me show you this brand new jersey that's up for grabs here. It is night mode. We see the Toronto cityscape, what it looks like in the evening. It's all part of City Connect, paying tribute, the team says, to our city's lively energy after the sun goes down. So it is available to buy as of 8 o'clock this morning. A whole bunch of fans came out to Rogers Centre to check it out this morning, lining up to get their hands on these dark jerseys, looking pretty fashionable. And they've got some endorsement from some Jays heavyweights, some icons. Jose Bautista, Edwin Encarnacion, here's what they think about the jerseys. Have a listen. Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, it changes the look, changes the feel. I can't wait to see them out on, on the field tonight. I um, think they're going to look really sharp with the pants, just like a little uh, Batman-like kind of, <laughs> you know, yeah. night mode. So, yeah, it's cool. I think uh, everybody's going to be excited about them tonight. If we, if we was playing, like, I was sleeping right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah, no, we're very excited. Like, we're very happy, like, to be back to the city and, and see this uh, new uniform, the City Connecting. So uh, it's very special for us, like, be back with, with the city, like, that we love. So it's very something special for us. Okay. Members of the Jays' active roster will be debuting those jerseys on the field just a few hours from now on the other side of the glass here. And they're also going to be wearing these City Connect jerseys appropriately at night here at home uh, for about 14 games this season. They're going to be wearing them again tonight when they take on the Pirates. And the Jays, by the way, coming in here after winning their first series, their sweep is bringing them here at home to hopefully win another one with their new jerseys on. Back to you guys. Hey, Melissa, thanks so much. They look really cool. Well, coming up next on CP24 Live at noon, Donald Trump has made history by becoming the first former president convicted of felony crimes. We're going to take a look at what happens next. These people, they were able to use people salacious. By the way, and nothing ever happened. There was no anything. Nothing ever happened, and they know it. But they were as salacious as they could be, and it had nothing to do with the case, but it had to do with politics. There you see Donald Trump speaking to reporters this morning. This is a day after becoming a convicted felon and once again painted himself as a victim of political persecution. And for more on this, we're joined live by Stephen Farnsworth, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs and Director at the Center for Leadership and Media Studies. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Some stunning comments from Donald Trump this morning. I don't even know where to begin. Um, Donald Trump says this is all done by Joe Biden and his people. He says the trial was rigged and says it happened because he's beating Joe Biden in the polls. What stood out to you? Well, I, I think in many ways we see from Donald Trump today what we've seen from Donald Trump all along. Donald Trump always plays the victim. It's never Donald Trump's fault. He lashes out at Biden. He lashes out at the prosecutor. He's even lashing out at, at his own uh, defense team. So what we see with Donald Trump is what we've always seen with Donald Trump. Um, but the problem for Donald Trump is that, uh, that you had 12 jurors selected by the prosecution and defense that voted 12 to nothing, 34 separate times times that Donald Trump committed a crime. And that's extraordinary for a former president. Okay. And Stephen, along those lines, just, you know, taking a look at the overall picture. So in the States, um, you cannot vote if you are a convicted felon. However, there's nothing preventing Donald Trump from actually holding office. And he's actually polling up. 
Yeah, the polls show right now a 50-50 contest in this country. Uh, the uh, state of the uh, the polls may change after this conviction. We'll see in a few days whether there's going to be much of a change. My guess is that there won't be all that much of a change, maybe a few points here or there, but because it's better not to be convicted of a crime than to be convicted of one if you're running for president. Uh, but the reality is that Donald Trump is in a very good position with respect to where he stands in the Electoral College with those swing states and where he stands uh, with respect to the national numbers. It's a 50-50 contest despite all the trouble that Donald Trump is in right now. So there's obviously legal implications here and all eyes are on sentencing, which is set to take place next month. We know Donald Trump and his legal team are planning on appealing, but obviously there are political implications here. And I want to talk to you about this. Um, Trump's campaign said today that it had raised almost $35 million in donations after the verdict. And today he asked people to continue donating. What do you make of this phenomenon, Stephen? Well, it's very clear that Donald Trump has an immense support uh, among his base of Republican voters. I mean, the Republican Party has largely become a Donald Trump party. And the reality is that people are perfectly willing to give Donald Trump money. Uh, they did it for Truth Social. They may have lost a lot on those investments. Uh, they did it during his presidential campaigns. Uh, this is no uh, surprise. I think the big question with respect to campaign contributions is uh, what we see in the upcoming polls. If uh, there is a significant decline decline in Trump's support as a result of these convictions, which is possible. Um, will, this, will the Trump campaign still be seen as a good investment, a good place to put your money, as opposed to maybe contributing to other candidates, Republican candidates running uh, for the Senate or in gubernatorial elections instead? Stephen, how does this rewrite the history, the political landscape of the states? Well, I, I think it's important to recognize that we've never been here, um, and we don't know uh, really what kind of impact this is going to have. This is the first time a former president was charged with a series of crimes like this, the first time convicted of crimes like this. And so we really don't know what this is going to play out. In the short term, I think people will just simply go back to their partisan corners. Democrats will say, we weren't going to vote for Trump anyway. Uh, Republicans will say, we were going to vote for Trump anyway, and this doesn't change anything. So I, I tend to think that the partisan division that exists in America, a partisan division that Donald Trump has benefited from, um, will continue to exist and continue to create an environment where half the country uh, is totally at odds with the other half. Uh, Stephen, we know that these types of things can really galvanize the Trump voter base. If you're Joe Biden looking at this, are you a little worried today or are you feeling good? Well, I, I think that the reality is that this is the optimal outcome for the Biden team. Uh, if Trump had been acquitted or if there had been a hung jury, uh, Trump would be on a victory tour right now instead of talking about all the people who've wronged him at this news conference today. Uh, and so the Biden campaign has an opportunity here to change the subject. Uh, I think one of the key problems that the Biden campaign is facing is that they're not very good at public relations. I don't think uh, they've had a very effective strategy of making the case for Joe Biden. I think they're much more focused on uh, trying to to make the case that Donald Trump shouldn't be president. But what this situation does, these convictions, what they do for Joe Biden is a chance to change the subject away from the conversations that he doesn't want to have about maybe how the economy hasn't been going so well or maybe how immigration numbers aren't what they should be. Uh, and those kinds of things don't come along very often, these external opportunities to change the subject. The question is, will Joe Biden take advantage of it? It's not clear that he will. And we've been showing our viewers some live shots outside of Trump Towers in New York, where it's still a very active scene. We've seen some demonstrators show up there as well. Stephen Farnsworth, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs and Director Center for Leadership and Media Studies. There is that live shot from Manhattan. There's the Trump Tower. Again, some Trump supporters and some critics showing up. Very active scene there. Stay with us for the latest on this story. And coming up next on TV24 Live at noon, Toronto Police have released its 2023 hate crimes report. There's a significant jump last year. We're going to take a closer look at that report next. New numbers from Toronto Police today. The service reporting hate crimes skyrocketed by 47% in 2023. Donald Trump speaks to reporters a day after a jury found him guilty on all 34 felony counts he was facing. This is a live shot outside of Trump Tower in Manhattan. All the latest coming up.
And the Jays are going to debut their new uniforms tonight when they host the Pittsburgh Pirates. And City Connect jerseys are now available for fans who buy the team cop. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Lena Latifa. And I'm Bakari Savage. Toronto police say that there was a significant increase in the number of hate crimes reported last year. The service says there were 365 hate crimes reported to police in 2023 compared with 248 in 2022. That is an increase of 47 percent. The report says the Jewish, 2S LGBTQ, Black and Muslim communities were the most frequently victimized groups. Mischief to property, assault and uttering threats were the most common offenses. Police say the Israel-Hamas war is one of the reasons for the rise in hate-motivated incidents. This increase of hate crime speaks to the traumatic effect the conflict was having on the communities and thus accelerated the unprecedented response by the service to address this crisis. The service expanded the size of the hate crime unit from six dedicated members to a team of 32. The hate crime unit also changed its mandate and adopted a centralized model, taking care of all hate crime investigations, including suspected hate crimes and hate incidents. Police say 59 people were charged in relation to 61 incidents last year. And Toronto Police Chief Mary Dimq gave an update this morning on response times to priority one calls, which rose to more than 22 minutes late last year. I am pleased to report that the trend of modestly improving our response to priority one calls continues. The average response time to priority one calls for service is now 17.9 minutes which is an improvement over the 22 minutes we saw late last year. More needs to be done, as this is not the standard that Torontonians expect and deserve. Experience tells us that increased call volumes, special events, and daily opera operational pressures will affect response times during the busy summer season. We are also now seeing an increase in response times for lower priority calls. The chief says that hiring more officers and strategic deployment are keys to getting response times down. Well, police have outlined the circumstances under which they would take action to clear the pro-Palestinian encampment at the University of Toronto. Given the manner in which events have unfolded to date, including the fact that the demonstrators were permitted by the University of Toronto to remain on their property and the decision of the Quebec court denying McGill University and interim injunction, the Trespass to Property Act does not give the Toronto Police Service sufficient legal authority to clear an encampment. Therefore, absent a material change of circumstances, the Toronto Police Service will only act in situations involving an emergency to enforce the law and protect public safety or act in accordance with a court order. Deputy Chief Rob Johnson cited a recent court decision in Quebec that denied an injunction to clear the encampment and the fact that U of T initially allowed the demonstrators to remain on campus. The school has applied for its own injunction, which will not be heard in court until late June. Well, two men have been charged with multiple firearms offenses and what police say is an investigation also linked to three murders. 34-year-old Corey Denton from Scarborough and 37-year-old Jasveer Gill from Quebec are facing weapons possession and firearm discharge charges in relation to three residential shootings that occurred in Brampton. So Peel police say those shootings are connected to a homicide in Mississauga and a double homicide in Caledon, all taking place in November of last year. Peel police were called out last night to two separate fatal crashes involving motorcycles. A man in his 20s was killed in a collision involving a motorcycle and an SUV in Mississauga. It happened just before 10 p.m. near Derry and Mavis Roads. Police say the man who was driving the motorcycle was rushed to a trauma center but later died of his injuries. A woman in the SUV taken to hospital with minor injuries. Police say it's early in the investigation, but they are looking at speed and dangerous driving as possible factors in the collision. Anyone that was in the area at the time that this occurred at 9.45 p.m., it is our belief at this time that there were a number of pedestrians and other motorists that were in the vicinity of this collision. They are urged to reach out to, to members, investigators from our major collision bureau as, again, that's the type of evidence that's going to help determine what happened and what the biggest cause was behind this incident. 
And Bill, police say that the motorcycle collided with a transit bus at here Ontario Street and Petworth Road. This is north of Sandalwood around 6 o'clock yesterday evening. The motorcycle, a man in his 20s, suffered critical injuries and died at the scene. No one on the bus was hurt. An investigation is now underway to determine if charges will be laid. It is likely that uh, there could be charges that arise from this, depending on the evidence that's collected and analyzed by, by our investigators. Uh, but it is a tedious pro uh, progress. And as you can see behind me, there is a, uh, a very extensive road closure in place with uh, a lot of evidence markers on the road, which indicate that there's a lot of evidence for them to go through. So once our investigators have a chance to analyze all that evidence that they've gathered at the scene, they would have a, uh, a better idea of whether or not charges are appropriate. Peel police are appealing for witnesses to the crash or anyone who was in the area and may have dash cam video. Three men are facing a combined 292 charges following a traffic stop by the OPP in Brampton. Police say they stopped a vehicle on Peel Center Drive in the city of Brampton Wednesday night. When they searched the vehicle, they found dozens of credit cards, identities, a quantity of drugs and money. Vishal Deep Singh, Jaskaran Singh and Sukh Jinder Singh are all facing trafficking charges as well as charges related to possessing credit cards and IDs. And there's just a week left before thousands of frontline TTC staff could walk off the job. Workers, they're gearing up for a strike. A practice picket line was set up outside the Wilson TTC complex this morning. The workers' union says it's part of the plan to be ready. More than 11,000 operators, collectors, station staff, and other employees could hit the picket lines for real on June 7th. Wages, benefits, and job security, they're all key sticking points at the bargaining table. We just want to say to the general public that this is not where we want to be. Uh, this is an employer-driven process, and if the employer comes to the table with reasonable offers and, and uh, you know, reasonable um, wages and so on and so forth, that the strike can be averted. But notwithstanding that, we're preparing for the inevitable, and um, we should expect that transit service will be disrupted on June the 7th, pending no outcome of a successful negotiation. I am very confident that we can reach a deal. Uh, both parties are at the negotiating table where they belong. They have been there multiple times this week negotiating. I understand that progress is being made, uh, and I'm confident that we can get there, especially when both sides want a deal. Everyone here wants a deal, so we are confident there's a path forward. The TTC issued a statement. It reads in part, quote, the TTC values the important work that all our employees do every day to deliver safe and reliable service. The employees in ATU Local 113 are an integral part of our operations. Currently, bargaining teams from ATU Local 113 and the TTC remain at the table. This is where we can continue to negotiate a new collective agreement to replace the one that expired March 31st, 2024. We remain optimistic that we can reach a deal at the bargaining table. Expanded cell service within the subway system will slowly come online throughout the summer. Telecommunications crews are working overnight and during already scheduled closures to build out the 5G network outside the downtown core. Service will expand along line two and north on line one with more underground track coming online as it's completed. Right now, cell service is available at all stations, but only in the tunnels in the U of the downtown core. Work is being done during overnight and weekend construction, windows to minimize disruption to the riders. When complete, the new network will deliver seamless wireless coverage with mobile voice and data services in all 75 stations and tunnels across Toronto's subway system. The federal government was forced to step in last fall to require Bell, Rogers and Telus to cooperate in providing cell service to all customers and commit to a two year timeline. And we should note Bell has released a statement that reads in part, our teams are ready and Bell customers can expect access to these expanded coverage areas at the same time as outlined in our agreement. We are still waiting to hear from Rogers and Telus. CP24 is a division of Bell Media. Hey, coming up next on CP24 Live at noon, lifeguards are going to be back at some Toronto beaches tomorrow. Welcome back. The Blue Jays City Connect jerseys are now available at the team store. CB24's Melissa Duggan has a preview, and she joins us live with the latest. Hey there, Melissa. 
Hi, Lena. Okay, when you see the Blue Jays hit the diamond tonight, they are not going to be looking like this. No, these baby blue, white, sometimes darker blue jerseys, they are not going to be on the field. Instead, the brand new City Connect jerseys will be worn. They are darker. They represent our city at night. Dare I say they are moody is the word I would use to describe them. We did talk to the Jays VP of fan experience, though, to break down just kind of the idea behind this new look. Have a listen. This is a reflection of uh, the city. So if you think about that iconic shot when the, the sun goes down in the nighttime, you see the reflection of the lights into Lake Ontario. So the color of the jersey is pitch blue. So it isn't black. Right. I know I it looks black, yeah. but it's so navy and so dark that it looks black to the eye. So pitch blue, like the hue of Lake Ontario. Um, you know, this is Hyper Royal is our new blue. Okay. We like the pop of red too. We play for Canada. You know, we're still really proud that we play for an entire country. So that was really important that we kept that red in there. I was here for the bat flip. I lost yeah. my voice that day. Oh, wow. Insane. I got a picture hope he can design with the bat flip, so we'll see. And maybe Encarnacion. Oh, Edwin Encarnacion. How about you? Are you looking forward to meeting the, the I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dave issued Jose Bautista jersey. I want him to sign. Yeah. So I'm excited. That was fans reacting because there was a star-studded event today for the big launch of this new jersey. From Some Jays from days of yore were here. But today's active roster, they will be wearing these new jerseys when the first pitch flies at 7.07 p.m. And you'll see Jays wearing it when they play home games, but only at night. About 14 more games to go. Back to you guys. All right. That's pretty cool. CP24 is Melissa Duggan. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Melissa. Well, a heads up for drivers on Sunday. Both major highways into the city will be closed. The Garden is going to be closed from South Kingsway to the DVP, and the DVP will be closed from the Gardner to York Mills from midnight Sunday until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is all for the Bike for Brain Health. This is where over 10,000 cyclists will take to the roads in support of the goal to defeat dementia. All the funds raised will go directly to the Baycrest Foundation. And there will also be a partial closure on the Line 1 subway this weekend. Service between both ways, service rather both ways between St. Clair and Shepherd Young stations is shut down Saturday and Sunday for planned track work. Shuttle buses will operate. Service will resume on Monday at 6 a.m. And the TTC's deputy CEO was asked about whether they consider moving the subway closure in light of Sunday's highway closures and the Jays game in the afternoon. In Toronto is a hugely popular place. There are events going on every weekend. And we, while we try, we work very closely with transportation at the City of Toronto. We, tr we strive to minimize the inconvenience to select groups. At any point when we have a system closure, there's going to be some minor inconvenience. We do our very best to minimize that. We work collaboratively across all of the city departments to make sure that that's accomplished. So unfortunately, the work has to be done. Uh, so parts of our system are 70 years old and older, and uh, they need work that sometimes can't be accomplished in that tiny window between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Toronto police say to expect significant delays in the downtown core, particularly on the arterial roadways. It could be a really brutal time, so just give yourself lots of extra time and consider transit. Well, lifeguards will be back at some Toronto beaches beginning tomorrow. The city lifeguards are identifiable by their red and yellow uniforms. They're going to be stationed either in white rowboats in the water or Along the shore, at a lifeguard stand, designated swim areas are marked between two red over yellow flags with a lifeguard stand marked lifeguard on duty nearby. Well, those who missed out on the Northern Lights show earlier this month, I was one of those people, might get a second chance to see the Aurora activity. After a roughly two-week hiatus on the other side of the sun, the sunspot region responsible for this solar event has shifted directions toward the Earth-facing side of our star. The activity not expected to be quite as powerful as last time. However, most of Canada could potentially see the solar storms tonight, with many more possible in the weeks to come. Welcome back. Repelling from a building in downtown Toronto. That, too, all for a really good cause. It's happening tomorrow and is the goal of pro-action cops and kids 
over the edge 2024. Yeah, it's bringing cops and kids together literally for skill building, mentoring to create trust, respect, and safer communities. And for more, we're joined live in studio with Derek Guile, Pro Action Cops and Kids Board President and Inspector Peter Danos, Pill Regional Police and Pro Action Pill Chapter Liaison, and Michelle Marchetti, Pro Action Cops and Kids. So we have to talk about this. Let's talk about the connection with Cops and Kids. What's the purpose? Well, Pro Action Cops and Kids has been a charity in Toronto for over 30 years and it's expanded beyond Toronto now. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a charity that I like to say does great things that not enough people know about. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this opportunity to let us talk about Pro Action Cops and Kids. And exactly as you said, the interaction is the ability for cops and kids to get together, engage in skill building and, and mentorship programs with the vision of creating a safer community and skill building uh, opportunities for for risk for for youth that are sometimes are at risk so it's a great opportunity for them this is such a great way to bring an entire community and so many families together uh, the event is sold out because it's very popular but the fundraising continues Michelle yes so we're at 107,000 right now we're goal this year is 125,000 we are sold out at 150 <sighs> repellers this year so there's lots of people going from the top of the Weston Harbor Castle down from the 35th floor. Um, it's pretty exciting. I did it last year myself. And uh, it's, it's really an exhilarating experience. And, you know, if anybody's interested, they're welcome to come down and check it out. But do get in early next year. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. speaking of Danos, you're yeah. going to be one of the cops that we'll <laughs> see going down. Uh, talk about that. What are people going to see when they're walking downtown along the waterfront and they just happen to look up? <laughs> you're literally going to see people walking down the side of a building. It's really very so cool. cool to watch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a DJ and we do a barbecue. It's a really wonderful way to bring our communities together. We have five chapters in ProAction and we make sure they all come together with cops and kids teams and supporters and it's a lovely community event. Inspector Danos, you did this last Year. You repelled last year as well, not your first rodeo. What is it like doing that with the kids? Um, it was my first time. It was a terrifying experience. <laughs> but uh, our officers that mentor these youth through this event helped me get through it. So I was relying on the younger kids to come over my fears. <laughs> that. So it was a spectacular day. I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to it again this year. What can you say about the benefits of the mentoring opportunities? So I, I think what I can tell you is we have many officers that join policing with some talents and passions, culinary arts, science programs, sports. So now they have the ability to rely on cops and kids to fund these programs for some of our youth, priority youth and priority populations, and provide these opportunities that they wouldn't normally have. Derek, what's and it like it's for you to see that It's impact, a fantastic yeah. way to build trust and mutual respect between the youth in these cities and the chapters that we're involved with and the cops. That doesn't always exist. So that's really a tremendous benefit of Pro Action Cops and Kids. Yeah, and this has been going on since the 90s. What have been the direct benefits that you all have seen happening in the community and in these kids' lives and also the lives of the officers because they get a benefit from mentoring as well? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the benefits we didn't realize at the beginning that the cops actually benefit from this as well, more as much or more than the kids do. So giving back as well. But it's just it's just a fantastic. I mean, there's so many great stories about kids that have been, you know, that it's, it's endless. You can't even begin. So the programs run from anything from cooking classes all the way to cricket teams and hockey teams mm -hmm. and canoe trips. So it's a lot of things that some of that youth just don't get the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. And now they get to do it with a cop. And hopefully they have a rewarding experience and, you know, they benefit. We all benefit from safer communities in the end. Michelle, this, this has got to be really rewarding for you. You've yes. been a part of this for so many years. Yes. So for me, it's the stories I get from the kids. Um, I, you working in communications and hearing what they have to say. I have kids from Hamilton who've come out of a program who, you know, are now police officers, are nurses working in burn units, um, just doing amazing things, worked through COVID, wouldn't have had those opportunities had there not been a police mentor there for them. And it's just amazing. One kid, I'll just end it with that, yeah. is he said to me, you know, I want people to see when I come back to my community, not only can you make it out, you can come back and do great things. That's that for me is just so rewarding. So that's why I do what I do. So meaningful. Yeah. Love it. Thanks a lot, Derek Gow, Pro Action Cops and Kids Board President, Inspector Peter Daniels, Pill Regional Police, and Pro Action Pill Chapter Liaison, and Michelle Marchetti, Pro Action Cops and Kids.
Thank you. Have so much fun tomorrow, and good luck with the event. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching CP24 Live at noon.